Willie, what years were you in Vietnam? I was there from 65, beginning, the very beginning of 65, through the end of 65, and then for most of 66, um, and then again in 67, and then again in 68, uh, very short tours mm -hmm. of six weeks, maybe mm -hmm. two months. Uh, then again in 69, and then very briefly in 71. You had the unique experience of going back and forth. Uh, when you would come back to the States, would you find that people, I presume you came back to the States, am I right in that? Mainly, mainly back to Western Europe, but back to the States a couple yeah. of times. Did you find that uh, there was a great lack of interest here in what you'd been doing out there? Or no, there was a terrific interest yeah. in Vietnam. Uh, it was more an anguish, I would say, than an interest, particularly in the later years, mm -hmm. uh, particularly after Tet. Um, there was, it had become a, a festering mm -hmm. uh, wound in the country, I think. And, uh, the only thing people really wanted to know about Vietnam in the latter years was when is it going to be over. Mm -hmm. Well, during the years you were out there, what kind of cooperation did you, uh, uh, you receive from the military? And did it change over the years, you know? Well, the cooperation up until the post-Tet period was wonderful to the extent that, uh, that we couldn't have covered that war without the military. Uh, you could practically summon up your own helicopter. Um, you could get all over the country. You could get dropped into the thick of battle, which we all of us did, on a, on a one-way trip with a medevac helicopter. So that, in, in terms of that kind of cooperation and access to the story, the government was wonderful. Uh, perhaps later on they wished they hadn't been so cooperative. Uh, then it started to diminish after Tet. There was much less cooperation. Well, uh, you say in, in that kind of cooperation. What kind of co cooperation did you not receive later on? What did they do? Were they telling you something less than the facts? Oh, there was always, a, they were pretty much routinely, they were telling you less than the facts, and I don't particularly condemn them. Uh, it's your job as a journalist to find the truth uh, and not be taken by the hand. Uh, and it's very often the job of, of uh, people who speak for the government to fudge the truth where it became uh, more important than an adversary relationship between a re digging a correspondent and a, and a stubborn official is when they were actively spreading untruths, whether it was on troop numbers, uh, on plane losses, um, on the true intelligence assessment of the enemy. Then I think you're into another area that goes beyond the relationship between a correspondent who wants to know and an official who wants to keep him from knowing, you're getting into an active area of disinformation by, by the government. Well, there was, there were stories back here. We heard them either by word of mouth, sometimes in print, uh, that uh, indicated that the, the adversary relationship between the military and the press was so strong that the military questioned the patriotism of the press. Was that accurate or inaccurate? Oh, there was a constantly question the patriotism of, of, of uh, reporters if the report didn't particularly suit the, either the whim of a junior officer on the ground or the policy of a senior officer back in the Pentagon. Um, so yeah, they did question uh, uh, one's, one's patriotism um, in all kinds of ways. and. Uh, um, you must remember that the United States was in a very peculiar position in Vietnam. Uh, almost throughout, they maintained the sham that this was a Vietnam's war, not America's war, and they were there simply assisting, even when we had a half a million men there. So that um, questioning one's patriotism becomes a bit funny because it's not an American war, quote unquote. I have a vivid recollection of you in a, in a firefight, lying alongside of a road, lying back, looking up at the camera, somewhat out of breath, describing the, the incident. And uh, it leads me to, to ask you about the thought that a correspondent has about the, the cost and the pain and the, the apparent folly of war and how one divorces oneself from all that 
while reporting a war. Do you think about it at all? I think in the heat of, a, of the kind of report you're talking about, you really aren't thinking about much about much but survival um, and perhaps the fall of the war <laughs> as it directly affects you at that moment. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that in a war like the, the Vietnam War, one is constantly being confronted with those thoughts, with the waste, uh, because I think to many, many people, either then or subsequently, uh, the, the utter waste of that war became apparent, I think, to most of the reporters in Vietnam, because, uh, as I tried to say in this conference, uh, there seemed to, it seemed to lack a strong moral core, strong intellectual core, or a strong strategic core in the you know, future of Western civilization kind of strategic core, uh, or a civilization period. And so uh, I think given that, given that I don't think many people really believed in that war, even though they will go to their graves saying they did, uh, the next assumption must, one must make is that it is a dreadful waste. Well, would the United States be better off, and this is not my area, I'm a reporter, but uh, in its relationship with Southeast Asia, had it not gone to big war in Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. would it be w better or worse than it is now, having gone to war, and Peter Braithrop aside, uh, having lost the war. The war was lost. I don't think people, it's very hard for Americans to face that. Certainly, Morley, when you did that broadcast I referred to a moment ago, did that report lying in the road there when his guns were going off, you, I am quite sure, got a uh, commendation from New York. Did, they, did you get anything that said, great, give us more of the same? Uh, probably, no, they would tend to, to just say, great, don't take any chances, but give us more of the same. Not in quite those words. Um, Sure. I mean, there was pressure on sure. it, um, to come up with, quote, good stories, unquote. Yeah. There's no question. A lot of action? That they want action? I don't think anybody could ever find a cable if I went back in the file saying, more action, more action. No. But it was implied. Yeah. Did you feel, did you feel that pressure? Or did you think of that when you went out to get stories? Were you thinking in terms of, gee, I've got, I've got, to, get, I've got to get something that's... Uh, Shows a firefight, combat? Uh, no, not in quite that way. I think what you do is when you go on a military operation, mm. um, there is not much point in going on it as a journalist or indeed as a soldier unless there is going to be the positive side to it and the positive side to it uh, is somebody getting killed, and preferably the people you're shooting at if you're a soldier. Um, than uh, the people being shot at. So that um, obviously no one in Vietnam simply wanted to go for a walk in the sun. Did you ever get any feedback from, uh, from the general public, the viewing public, that would indicate how they were reacting to your reporting? You don't get f fan mail overseas, but you might get... Uh, well, you got mail, um, mm -hmm. and I think it's always hard to tell, uh, particularly letters in those days, to people on the evening news. Uh, uh, people who write letters tend to have an axe to grind, mm -hmm. so it's not uh, utterly discounted, I don't mean to say, but it tended to be from people taking one extreme view or another. Where were you at the time of Milai? I was in, I had already begun to do 60 Minutes. I see. I, I know that. Or I'm just about to do 60 minutes because I... You were in the States then, right? I think so. Either the States or Europe. The story broke here, did it not? Yeah, but I did go and uh, I went back or went to Milai uh, in 1971, I think. Have you ever thought about mm -hmm. why that story broke in the United States and didn't break over there? Did, the, did they not know there anything about it? There weren't too many survivors. Mm -hmm. There weren't too many mm -hmm. survivors of it. Besides which, um, a village massacre in Vietnam was not all, not all that unusual if you were a Vietnamese villager. And I don't mean to suggest that Amer I, 
My Lai was not the norm as far as the American troops were concerned. But there were plenty of My Lai's, I'm sure, committed mainly by the other side and by South Vietnamese troops. Mm -hmm. So the, the death and destruction by foreigners or friendlies uh, in the Vietnamese countryside uh, was something that the Vietnamese people had lived with for certainly the most of the life of any person alive back in the late 60s. Do you feel that story would, would never have come out if it had not come out the way it did here in the States with the... Yeah, probably. Probably not. not come out. Mm -hmm. Did your enthusiasm for your assignment over there, uh, did, you, did you get sick of it eventually? I got sick of it after the first nine or ten months, mm -hmm. most of which I had not left Vietnam in that time. It was a, we were a very small bureau, and, and you were working awfully hard uh, with a lot of pressure on you, and, and uh, it was a very competitive story. Uh, we like to think we were in front of a competition most of the time, but uh, it was physically exhausting and emotionally kind of draining. The young people in the United States during that period, it has been said, developed their cynical attitude, a cynical attitude, because television showed how terrible war really was. Would you agree? I don't know that it was a cynical attitude, I think, that developed in the United States. And I think, in a way, it was an extraordinarily altruistic one, uh, maybe even naive. Uh, um, I don't, and whether television was responsible or not, I don't know. But I think, if I think of the attitudes of, of, the, of that period, of the 60s, um, it was hardly cynicism. I mean, it was brave new world, brave new future. All you have to do is get rid of this president, this government, that government, stop this war, and we'll all be you know, following butterflies and well, political campaigns. Well, when I say campaign. cynicism, I speak of young people who said, I, I don't want to go to that war because I don't believe in what that war represents or what the, the government seems to believe I don't it think it was cynicism. Um, curiously enough, I think Americans are wonderfully, for the most part, uncynical. Um, I don't think it was cynicism. I think there was so much doubt about that war by not just those young people, but by their parents. Maybe not terribly well articulated by their parents or maybe not uh, wishing to doubt their government, but I think there was great unease about this war right from the beginning. Well, that unease, that pressure on the government that brought about an end to the war, did that, in your opinion, stem from the actions of the young people in this country? The middle class itself, I would think you might agree, uh, became heart sick and weary of that war. But what caused it? Well, th that state of mind. Was it television reporting it and the print press? Was it the action of the young and the sum total of all that? No, well, I, I, I think it's just too easy to blame, uh, to blame the coverage or praise the coverage, if you like, uh, for having done this. I think that the, the war reporting, while it obviously has an effect and certainly a cumulative effect, I think for the most part what disillusioned people in the United States was the war, that this war had gone on to one degree or another for more than a decade, uh, had proven nothing, had gotten no great gains, had uh, not thrown up any wonderful democratic leader at any point in Vietnam, and that Americans were dying by about a hundred a week at one point, so that I don't think us covering this or underlining it, which is simply, a, or simply reporting it, uh, affected it one way or the other. I think it might have gone on six months longer without us. I don't know. I think it, we will never know. But but uh, no, I think the country got fed up with the war. Period. Of course, maybe we overestimate the the power of the free press in a democracy. But one wonders, after Vietnam, if uh, our free press makes us unable to fight a war again in the democracy. I don't know. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. I think that it certainly, 
is a factor. Um, but at the same time, I think in any situation in this which this country was threatened, or even its interests, its important interests threatened, uh, there would be the kind of response that has occurred before in the history of the country, whether the press was being picky or not. Well, succeeding generations forget about wars, too, I suppose. And uh, if there is no memory, no immediate memory, of uh, what went on, let's say, in Vietnam. Oh, except I think that there's a, that succeeding, no succeeding generation is ever going to be like some preceding generation mm -hmm. anyway. Mm -hmm. The issues as clearly defined as the Second World War will probably never arise again mm -hmm. uh, because the issue of, of the survival of civilization is there, all sorts of other things. Um, I think there is a fine distinction between wars that are perceived as wars of survival and wars that are perceived, rightly or wrongly, to be wars of imperial conquest or something. And uh, so there's, there's, uh, I don't think that it's, it's going to be the issues and alternatives that future generations face will never will not be the same as the Vietnam generation or the World War II generation. Well, will the role of the, quote, war correspondent, unquote, be any different, do you think, in the future than it is, has been in the, in the immediate past? I think so. In what way? Well, immediate, depends how immediate mm -hmm. you mean the past to be. Well, I'm speaking of Vietnam, really, and... Uh, well, I think Vietnam, in a funny way, although you describe it as the first television war, and it may be that, it was the last old-fashioned war from a reporter's point of view because there was still a gap between you on the ground as a reporter making judgments and this absolutely instant communication that has developed since in which some wise guy in New York or Los Angeles can make the judgments for you or will try to. And uh, I think that has changed it more than almost more than anything else. Uh, so that the, the war, just as the war can be directed from the White House, the war coverage can be directed from the newsroom. What kind of censorship could we visualize for the future with all this instant, instant no, communication? No, I, I think censorship's gone out the window. And you don't think that uh, the, the old pattern will ever exist again? Right? It's very interesting to me, and this isn't quite, this isn't addressed censorship, but uh, I remember in Czechoslovakia in 1968 during the, the Prague Spring, when suddenly people started feeling their oats in this mm -hmm. country that had been so brutally dominated by the Soviets, <coughs> of watching a Czech television crew actually chase a politician down the street with a hand mic. And that was a revelation in that part of the world. You're going to see a little more of that, not because they're going to be relaxing their controls and their censorship or anything else. It's just kind of the way you do things now. So. Um, it's all changing. And I think m on balance, probably in certain ways for the better, more openness. I see certain traps about instant communication. I don't like editors directing stories and all of that. But generally speaking, I guess all of this stuff uh, has to make a, a positive difference.